Okay, so, ready to dive into something truly mind-bending. We're talking space-time singularities. You've provided some excerpts and diagrams from Hawking and Ellis's The Large-Scale Structure of Space-Time, and let me tell you, this book really gets into the weeds of where physics as we know it starts to, well, unravel. Yeah, and it's not just that it unravels, it's how it unravels. Hawking and Ellis really go there, you know? Exactly, no punches pulled. So, first things first, what is a singularity? really. We hear the term, and it's usually in the same breath as black hole, but what's the working definition here? Well, Hawking and Ellis, they describe a singularity as basically a point in space-time where the laws of physics, as we understand them, they just stop working. Imagine a region of space-time, right? And the boundary of this region just keeps shrinking, getting smaller and smaller until, poof, it's zero. And not over an infinite amount of time, but a finite amount. That's a singularity. Okay, that already sounds like something out of a science fiction movie, but instead of made-up jargon, we've got, like, serious physics. And they use this great visual figure one, this collapsing sphere of light. What's going on there? So figure one, that's illustrating a trapped surface, which is key when we talk about singularities. Picture light trapped inside this collapsing sphere, right? As the sphere shrinks, the area of both the ingoing and outgoing wavefronts of light, it decreases, and when it hits zero, boom, You've essentially got a singularity. The light, it has nowhere to go. So it's not just that the light is trapped, it's that space-time itself is closing in. You got it. And what's amazing is Hawking and Ellis connect this really abstract concept to real-world scenarios where we might actually find singularities. Okay, so hit me with it. What are some of those mind-bending scenarios? The big one, and everyone's heard of this, is the gravitational collapse of a massive star. Think a star way bigger than our sun, and when it runs out of fuel, it collapses under its own gravity so intensely it might form a singularity, a black hole. The other scenario is even wilder, though, and that's the Big Bang. Rewind the expansion of the universe, go all the way back, and you reach this point of insane density and temperature, Un another yeah. potential singularity. So singularities might be at the beginning and the end of a star's life, and maybe even our entire universe. That's uh, that's something else. We can't talk about singularities without talking about how they warp space-time around them, though, and that brings us to geodesics. Sounds like something out of Star Trek, but it's actually pretty straightforward once you get it right. Totally. Shortest distance between two points, usually we think straight line, right? Works in our everyday world. Hmm. But gravity, especially strong gravity, curves space-time, and those shortest paths, those geodesics, they become curved too. Figure two really shows this, how you've got this focal point messing with what we think of as the shortest route. Exactly. Imagine like a surface with a bump in it. Shortest path between two points on either side. You don't go over the bump, you go around it. That curved path, that's the geodesic. It's like taking a detour around a mountain instead of climbing over it, even if it seems longer on the map. But how does this all link back to singularities? Well, singularities, they're like gravity on steroids. They warp space-time so much that they can totally redirect light, even mess with cause and effect. This is where the causal structure of space-time comes in. Okay, causal structure sounds pretty intense, but lay it on me. Think of it this way. Causal structure dictates which events can influence other events. And the light cone, that's figure three, is important here. An event at the tip of the cone, it can only influence stuff within its future light cone. And it can only be influenced by things in its past light cone. Makes sense. So our light cones, determined by the speed of light, they're like the boundaries for cause and effect. Exactly. But here's where it gets really wild. Gravity, especially the extreme gravity of a singularity, it can warp these light cones. Imagine them getting, like, twisted or even flipped on their sides. Hold on. So a singularity could really mess with cause and effect itself. That's the thing about singularities. They push our understanding of the universe to the limit. But to really grasp space-time, we've got to go beyond our normal ideas of space and into, well, manifolds. Manifolds. Chapter two of the book dives into this, and it feels like we're entering a whole new level of, like, abstract thought. They're crucial, though. See, a manifold, it's a space that might look like our regular flat space if you zoom in close enough. Yeah. But zoom out, and they can be way more complex than the surface of a sphere. And to navigate this world of manifolds, Hawking and Ellis give us all these mathematical tools, mm -hmm. coordinate patches, atlases. It's a lot. It is, but think of it this way. A coordinate patch is like a small map of a section of the manifold. An atlas is a bunch of these patches that together cover the whole manifold. It's like figures four and five. So like taking a map of Earth and dividing it into smaller overlapping maps. Each small map is a coordinate patch, and the whole set is the atlas. Perfect analogy.
Just like you need different maps for different parts of Earth, you need different coordinate patches to describe different regions of a curved manifold. Like trying to flatten an orange peel no matter how you do it, you'll always have wrinkles and tears. You need multiple patches to show the full curved shape. Exactly. And in the same way, we need these different coordinate systems, these patches, to accurately describe space-time especially around singularities. Manifolds, coordinate patches, atlases. We're really getting into the weeds here. <laughs> we are, and we're just getting started. But before we go full on math, why does any of this matter? Why are these singularities so important? It's a fair question because they're fascinating and all, but how do they affect us? Think of it like this. They represent the very edge of what we know. Our current physics just breaks down in a singularity, meaning there's a whole lot more to discover, a whole new realm of physics. Who knows what we'll find? It's like we've got this map and we get to the edge and it just says, here be dragons. But instead of dragons, it's a whole new understanding of reality. But singularities, they're not just a theoretical puzzle. They have a real impact on how we see the universe. Take the Big Bang singularity, for instance. It's where our entire cosmological history starts. Right. Everything from the galaxies to us traces back to that initial singularity. It's like it's the cosmic seed for everything, past, present, future. That's a great way to put it. And as mind-blowing as singularities might seem, they're not just off in some distant realm. They affect our cosmic neighborhood. Like the singularities at the heart of black holes, they have a huge effect on their surroundings. So even though we can't see them directly, those singularities are shaping galaxies, messing with stars and planets, like the, un the unseen puppet masters of the cosmos. Exactly. And thinking about singularities, it doesn't just challenge what we know about the universe out there. It makes us think about the limits of knowing itself. You know, what can we really know about reality? It's humbling realizing these things exist that totally break our physics. Yeah. <laughs> but it's also exciting, right? Because there's so much more to learn. And speaking of pushing those limits, Hawking and Ellis, they don't just throw out big ideas. They've got the math. And a big part of their argument involves these things called energy conditions. What are they and why do they matter so much? Okay, so energy conditions, basically, they're like limits we put on something called the energy momentum tensor, which describes how matter and energy are spread out in the universe. So like the, the rules of the game for matter and energy, making sure everything doesn't just go haywire. So like the universe's safety regulations. Aha, uh -huh, kind of. One of the most important ones is the weak energy condition. Basically, it says that energy density can't be negative, at least not from the point of view of anything moving at or slower than the speed of light. Okay, so no negative energy. <laughs> Seems reasonable. Right. But it has huge implications. Like, no. It means gravity has to always be attractive. No repulsive gravity under these rules. Good thing, too, based on everything we've observed so far. Exactly. And then there's the dominant energy condition, which makes sure that energy can't go faster than light. Super important for keeping cause and effect straight. No faster than light shenanigans allowed. Mm. It's like these energy conditions are trying to keep the universe from getting too crazy. That's a good way to think about it. They impose some order, some predictability. And yeah. here's the mind-blowing part. Hawking and Ellis, they combine these energy conditions with all that math we talked about before. Manifolds, curvature tensors, the right degree equation. And they actually prove that singularities have to exist under certain conditions. So we're not just talking about some hypothetical idea here. These energy conditions are like the, the mathematical bedrock for singularity. Exactly. Hawking and Ellis blend rigorous math with real physical insight. And that's what makes their work so powerful. They show how equations can have very real, very strange consequences for the universe. It's like they've built a bridge between pure math and the universe we can observe. And we're standing right there watching it all come together. So are there like specific example solutions to Einstein's equations that give us a clearer picture of these singularities? There are, and they get pretty wild. We've got things like the Schwarzschild solution and the Kerr solution. Yeah. They describe the space-time around a black hole, Schwarzschild for a non-rotating one, Kerr for a rotating one. They give us a glimpse into those singularities at the center. So Schwarzschild is like the basic black hole and Kerr is the deluxe model with a spin cycle. Uh-huh. Yeah, something like that. What's really weird is these solutions show that the singularity in a black hole, it's not really a point in space, but more like a moment in time. Wait, a moment in time? How does that even... Yeah, it's a brain bender. Imagine <laughs> falling into a black hole. You wouldn't hit a solid bottom. Time itself would essentially end for you at the singularity. So it's not like hitting the ground. It's like hitting the, the end of time. Intense. Definitely intense. 
And to make it even weirder, that singularity, that end of time, it's hidden behind the event horizon, the point of no return, not even for light. Which is what makes black holes so creepy. We can't see past that horizon, so whatever's going on in there, it's a secret. The ultimate cosmic mystery box. And it gets weirder. The Schwarzschild and Kerr solutions, they show that inside a black hole, space and time, they switch roles. Switch roles? Now you're just messing with me. Nope, totally serious. <laughs> Imagine you're inside. You can't move freely through space anymore, but you're pulled towards a singularity through time. Moving through space would be as inevitable as moving through time is for us now. Okay, I need a minute to process that one. So inside a black hole, the singularity isn't a place to avoid. It's a moment you can't escape. Exactly. Not very intuitive, but that's what Einstein's equations tell us. My mind is officially blown, but we've been talking a lot about black holes. What about the Big Bang singularity? Does what we know about black holes tell us anything about the beginning of the universe? That's the billion dollar question. There are similarities, yeah, but also big differences. The Big Bang singularity created the entire universe, while black hole singularities come from one star collapsing. It's like comparing a sparkler to a fireworks show. Both involve light and explosions, but on totally different levels. Great analogy. And that there's another difference. We can study black holes from outside, see how they interact. But the Big Bang singularity, it's hidden behind this wall of incredibly hot, dense stuff that existed in the very early universe. Like trying to study a volcano by looking at, like, really old lava. You get clues, but no direct view. Exactly. Makes studying the Big Bang singularity a massive challenge. We rely on indirect stuff, observations, and theories to try to put the pieces together. So we've learned a lot about how the universe evolved, but that very first moment, that's still a mystery. For now, yeah. But here's where it gets even more interesting. Because to really crack the Big Bang, we need to go beyond Einstein, beyond Hawking, and into quantum mechanics. Quantum mechanics, where things get really weird. Right. We need a whole new set of tools to understand what went down at the Big Bang, because gravity and quantum mechanics they were both in play. This is where the search for a theory of everything, a theory of quantum gravity comes in, right? To bring those two worlds together, it's like we need a whole new way of thinking to even approach the beginning of everything. But for now, let's stick with what we've got. We were talking about these exact solutions to Einstein's equations. Are there more besides Schwarzschild and Kerr that can tell us about singularities? Oh yeah, there are some really strange ones. Like some solutions describe these things called wormholes tunnels connecting different parts of space-time. Wormholes, like cosmic shortcuts. That sounds a little too sci-fi. Right, but general relativity says they could exist. Nobody's seen one yet, but it goes to show how wild Einstein's equations can get. So maybe zipping around the universe isn't totally out of the question. I'm putting in my request now. But all this talk of wormholes, black holes, it makes the universe seem even more chaotic. It might seem that way. But remember, all this strangeness comes from the same equations that describe the order of the universe, too. And there are other solutions that tell us about that order. For example, some use what's called the cosmological constant, which is like this energy that's just built into empty space itself. Wait, so even a total vacuum has some energy in it? That's crazy. It is. And this cosmological constant, it can really change how the universe evolves. In fact, a positive one, like we see in our universe, can make it expand faster and faster. So this, this math term could be the reason the universe is expanding the way it is. That's a pretty big impact. It really shows you even the most abstract math can have huge implications for the real world. And who knows what other secrets we'll find as we uncover more of these exact solutions. So many questions, and every answer seems to bring up more. But let's bring this back down to Earth for a sec. Why should anyone care about singularities? How does this connect to our everyday lives? It's a fundamental question, right? Singularities seem so far out, but they're part of the fabric of reality. The Big Bang singularity, that point of infinite density and heat, it's the starting point for everything we know. Like our cosmic family tree, and the Big Bang singularity is way, way, way back at the start. Exactly. And those singularities and black holes, they're shaping galaxies, guiding stars, even playing a part in allowing planets like ours to exist. So we owe our existence to these things that we don't even fully understand. In a way, yeah. But even more than that, I think exploring singularities reminds us how much we don't know, makes us realize the limits of our knowledge and appreciate the mystery of the universe. It's a good reminder that the more we learn, the more we realize there's so much more to learn. Which brings up something I've been wondering. We've talked about how classical general relativity describes singularities, but also how we need quantum mechanics to really get them. 
Could those quantum effects maybe even prevent singularities from forming? That's the big question, isn't it? It's at the heart of so much of modern physics. Could there be something like a quantum pressure that pushes back against gravity and stops the singularity from collapsing into an infinitely tiny point? So instead of a point, it might be more like, I don't know, a quantum smudge. Maybe. And it gets to why quantum gravity is such a big deal. We're trying to find a theory that brings together general relativity and quantum mechanics to understand what happens when gravity and quantum effects collide. It's like we're right on the edge of a whole new understanding of how the universe works and singularities are the key. Exactly. We may not have all the answers, but that journey, that exploration, that's what makes science so incredible. Well said. So to everyone listening, we'll leave you with this. The universe is full of mysteries and singularities are some of the biggest. Keep thinking about these ideas, keep exploring space time and keep asking questions. Because sometimes even the most mind-bending concepts can bring us a little closer to understanding the universe and our place in it.